Hi, I wanted to do a quick video of some things that I usually don't see reviewed on the internet, uh, in some ways because they're just kind of old like I am. But I wanted to go back to what I had to deal with as a martial artist starting out in the early 70s through the 1980s in terms of the kind of uh, equipment we, we could find compared to what you can find online today in terms of, uh, of availability, quality, price, and things like that. And I want to specifically talk about swords made in Spain, because if you wanted a blade back then, uh, that's, that's what was in the stores And back in those days when we had brick-and-mortar knife shops. And if you wanted something like a Japanese katana, the most common thing they had on the shelf was um, its aluminum die-cast coated in chrome, which was sword-shaped and kind of pretty, and at least it had a scabbard to draw out of, but obviously no edge, no cutting ability, and if you hit anything with it, it would just bend like a pretzel. Um, for a little bit more money, you could get some Spanish-made steel swords. Now, the most common things you would see would be a lot of European historical um, reproductions, but the quality, there was quite a dichotomy to it. I still have at least one of these blades laying around somewhere, uh, but what you would get is either carbon steel or uh, high polished stainless steel which was usually a 440 and the carbon steel is actually pretty high carbon and they would they would go to the step of tempering the steel so it's hard and resilient it's got a little bit of flex there was no edge on it so you'd have to take uh, you know a little bit of time and care with a grinder or a sander or a whole lot of time if you just had like a file and stones but this thing has managed to take and keep a, a reasonable edge over the years uh, but there is, it's basically a slab of steel with a couple of little bevels on the edges to, to give it some shape. And in and, and this one, the tip isn't even even. But um, then you get some etching or something, and the etching on this one actually isn't bad. It's got some depth to it. But what you'd have is the blade would terminate, and then you would have just this little rat tail screw uh, welded on. And then it was screwed at the end of the pommel, and the handle was made usually out of a die cast guard and a die cast pommel. And the handle itself was usually just plastic. Uh, but if you ever hit anything with this, it would snap right off at the handle. Uh, and that would be the end of that. So it was pretty much designed just to be a thing to hang on a wall. Uh, that's not what we needed. We needed a thing to practice with. Thankfully, a European sword is uh, significantly longer than, say, a Chinese gen. So if I wanted a gen, I could take one, I could cut it off or break it off at the handle, and then grind down uh, the ricasso and turn it into a proper tang and then mount a handle on it. And this one's had several handles right now. It's sitting in something that's like a tong gen. But it's it, this, this configuration, it's extremely sturdy. However, because there's no taper, the balance is awful. Um, it's it's like a pipe. It's yeah, you know, like a piece of rebar. It's it's not exactly very elegant that way, but it, it can take a lot of abuse. Um, if you wanted a Japanese sword, well, they changed over the years, but what they started with was something basically like this. Uh, some of them had uh, fake ivory-looking plastic grips, which actually were the foundation of what became the Highlander sword. They just stuck a dragon head on it. Uh, but those you ran the risk. Some of those models actually had that rat tail. And a little screw hidden under the pommel and yeah if you hit something with it, it would break off but the ones that had more traditional configurations with ito um, they actually had a tang and a pin so you had something like that uh, that was a little sturdier actually a lot sturdier in a plastic grip with uh, a fake same texture which i've since repainted a long time ago to look you know, a little bit better uh, and I've rewrapped this one in leather so it's it's a little nicer than the cheap stuff they wrapped it with initially uh, the fixtures on this one um, they're actually brass which is kind of nice but as for the blade um, well you heard that sound you're gonna hear that again in a second it is uh, at least beveled a little bit more in the proportions of an actual katana not quite. Uh, the biggest glaring issue is that the uh, the mune, the spine, it's, it's just it's just flat. There's nothing to it. The the blade collar, the habaki, just doesn't even seem to fit the sword very well. It fits the scabbard, which is fine. And um, the uh, the edge is the the hamon is just etched on that edge. But you can sharpen it, and it keeps a decent edge. And like I said, it's probably about a 52 Rockwell. I've used this to do a lot of abusive cutting, but the balance is terrible. It's uh, there's no taper to it or anything else like that. And as for the scabbard, which I just dropped on the floor, um, it's just an aluminum tube with plastic fittings and a little plug on the end. 
and a paint job I've probably redone a hundred times. Inside are a couple of plastic inserts, but as you heard, yeah, really unpleasant sound in there, and the blade does indeed bounce off the metal uh, quite horribly. But this, this is what you can get. Now, over the years, they did improve the quality of these slightly so that the blade proportions looked a little bit better. Uh, you did get the peak mune and things like that and slightly better fittings. This, this is from circa probably 1976-78 is when I, I got this beast. But the, um, the, big, the basic problem with it still is it's not distal tapered, so the balance is awful. Uh, it's just a slab of steel with, uh, with an edge ground into it. Um, don't judge me. Official Shokusuge Ninja To. I picked this up in 83-84 to commemorate Ninja 3, The Domination, which was filmed in Phoenix, where I happened to be, and I actually got called out to a casting call, and, well, as Maz Kanata would say, that's a story for another time. But uh, the sword was cool. It's not the haunted one. And uh, this is actually not the original Suba. This is actually stolen off another, another Marto blade that I've since destroyed. The original Suba is, is this thing. It's... It's actually an impressively heavy slab o mild steel with a, a black powder coating and it's held up to a lot of abuse. The reason it's not on the sword is it's really heavy and it throws off the balance of the sword quite a bit and it's just a little too big and too wide for my hand. Sometimes I put it on just for show, otherwise it's, a, it's just a cool coaster. Like I said, it's heavy. Um, the blade on this one, I mean the scabbard, as I mentioned before, it's, um, it's just an aluminum tube with plastic fittings. You've got this little end thing with a hole in it. I guess it's supposed to be for a snorkel, is what they said. Yeah, okay. Um, the blade, again, you got that nasty sound coming out. Um, officially, this is this would be a real dynamic. It's seen in Chinese and Japanese swords, uh, a kiriha, which is a, a flat slab chisel sort of construction, which is something Marto can actually pull off fairly easily, but you've got a really flat blade with this beveled edge and then this diamond sort of cut uh, tip. Um, it's 440 stainless, but it's actually really hard and resilient, and I have abused the hell out of it. I cut bricks with this thing and not damaged it significantly, and it still reasonably holds an edge. Uh, but again, you know, flat spine and no distal taper, so it's balanced like a pipe. Um, not so bad in a handle, you know, dimension. It, it balances, you know, let's see where the balance point is just for fun. It's, it's not a bad spot, really. So that's what we had to deal with. It's what we had. Um, thankfully, about 1980, here's that noise. Not very ninja-y, but in 1980 I did manage to get in contact with a collector of Shinken. He was actually, uh, he had a lot of uh, gunto that were handmade, and I managed to score um, a couple of good blades that I still have to this day. They're kind of over my shoulder here, and um, the quality, of course, I was blown away. I'd never seen a real one before, and and my god, I, they, there's no no comparison. Uh, and speaking of no comparison, anything you pick up today that's made in China, uh, of the number of Chinese forges from Longchuan, uh, both in terms of Chinese and Japanese blades, there is no comparison with the quality to what we had to deal with back in the 70s and 80s, where we really, we really didn't have much to work with. And uh, I'm so grateful that, you know, people have, have you know, actually created some much, much better products, which I'll cover in other videos. But I just wanted to kind of cover these these forgotten legends and curses or whatever you want to call them that we had to deal with back in the day. Um, I've still kept a couple around just because I'm, I'm attached. But uh, as swords, hmm, not very good. So I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it amusing. And uh, we will see you again.